for me. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I mean, I don't know, I guess just to take a step back, you know, for um, the folks that, um, you know, aren't necessarily familiar with Rondo Hatton, I will always remember him from, uh, I believe it was one of his last films to the House of Horrors, uh, that, uh, you right. know, that classic, like, universal, um, that, that classic, like, universal sense of atmosphere, like, um, because, you know, that disease he had, you know, made certain features of ex- of his face just extenuous they're able to use lighting as a way to just capture and highlight those features to great effect in a lot of those early films but i guess my question would be what was it about rondo that robert burns found so captivating what was it that just kind of um that kind of uh you know, made made uh, him such a lifelong, uh, I don't want to say obsession, but, you know, kind of a lifelong... It was an obsession. It was an obsession, okay. It was an obsession, yeah. He would go to, you know, we're talking this is all pre-internet. He would go to the the big art house movie theater in Austin and uh, set up his camera and, the movies and find Rondo. And it, Rondo was in a hundred movies. Most of them are, if you look on IMDb, that's not nearly his credits, but most of them were as in the background. And so Bob said about trying to record those. Bob was a normal looking guy who was uh, very weird. And I mean, this is a compliment. He was very creative. He did all direction. Vaughn was, uh, Bob did the uh, posters for Stevie Ray's early band with his brother called Blackbird. The post that he did screen printing there's thousands of dollars. Uh, he could create intricate costumes. He could make things out of nothing. Uh, so he was great, you know, greatly creative. Uh, and Rondo was a strange looking guy who was really quite normal. He was an all-American kid, a great athlete. Everybody liked him. Uh, And Bob felt like, I I feel like Bob looked at Rondo and saw an inner ugliness that he perceived within himself. Other people didn't perceive that. Bob did. Uh, Bob felt like he was incapable of love. And Rondo, uh, after his acromegaly, met this beautiful woman who accepted him as, as what he was. You know, so there's a real you know, a real playoff of these two guys. And that's a lot of what we're doing in the film, along with talking about the film work, you know. Uh, one of the things I had to make sure of is that this didn't turn into a Texas Chainsaw Massacre documentary. A lot of it in there, because we talked to a lot of the chainsaw folks, but that's not what it is, uh, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's almost as if it's a... um I mean, uh, you know, kind of a tale of, you know, one's projection, right? Because, you know, yeah. if you have someone like internalizing their own loneliness and internalizing those negative thoughts to, you know, kind of forming their identity for them, you know, you start to feel so isolated that you are not able to, you know, feel that you have anyone to relate with. And it seems like he was using Rondo as almost a symbolic way to kind of project and confront those feelings within himself i think so i think that's that's very much on track and uh i mean i don't know i guess you know kind of uh shifting over to robert burns i mean you know for the folks that you know are unfamiliar um i mean he was like you said the art director on all of these horror movies texas chainsaw hills have eyes taurus trap i mean through his art direction, he was really able, especially in those early 70s films, to redefine what a horror movie was. And in his own way, he was a genius because, you know, you look at a, a film like Texas Chainsaw or even Taurus Trap, like, it's so um, it's so low budget, it almost looks like... Y- this is a house that you could find somewhere. Um, this, sure. you know, it, it's a place that does exist. And, you know, to kind of like have to, to kind of like grab that environment and redefine what atmosphere in a horror movie could be, you know, you have to have um, a lot of inner, a lot of inner shadow work that's kind of projecting out. 
And, and Bob had a philosophy. His philosophy was that you should not notice the art direction. Exactly what you had just said is that it should look like something that is familiar, that's strange. You know, that's where the fear comes from. And he said, if you notice the art direction, then the art director has failed. He did not like Chainsaw Massacre 2 because he thought the art direction was in your face. And I think uh, that is a movie where Toby Hooper really did what he wanted to do. Toby Hooper wanted it to be, that film to be funny, uh, you know, and over the top. And that is something that Bob, that just angered Bob. He, he at the premiere, he walked out of the screening, uh, you know, and we talked to Stuart, to the late Stuart Gordon, the director of Reanimator, and he was saying how he, he would still get people who asked him, where is this hospital that you used for the film? And he had to tell him that Bob Burns created it. It was just out of his head with some direction from Gordon. Uh, and he didn't, he didn't uh, do drawings or anything of it, which Gordon was a little bit concerned about. It. You know, you're really not going to draw me anything. He just made it. You know, he a guy who can go down to Goodwill, any thrift store, and just come away with stuff to create things. You know? Chainsaw, he, he just corrected, he, collect, he collected bones. Uh, his girlfriend at the time, her family had a ranch and they went out there and found bones, uh, you know, and so, and, and he recycled a lot of that stuff into other films as well. Fascinating yeah. guy. Yeah, I have to say I was, uh, I mean, I found it to be, um, you know, um, I don't want to say quite a relief, but I was uh, glad to see that, you know, Stuart Gordon, you know, popped up in this film, rest in peace, because, uh, you know, when uh, when he had passed, like he was without a doubt one of my favorite horror directors. I mean, you, you look at a movie like Dolls, where he just captures that perfect kind of like, I would like, well, like we were talking about with Rondo, like that kind of universal, classic golden age monster movie aesthetic and just like redefined it, you know, for the new slasher era of the 80s and uh you know being able to to uh you know have you talk with him before he died is uh yeah that's just fantastic he was a great guy really really nice very generous uh, you know we had to we had to rent a facility in in the los angeles area uh for to do the interview uh but he was great about it uh you know yeah, and no. I wish we could use more. You know, that's the deal with all this. You, when you make a film, you only can use so much, uh, and we've got so much more. You know, we had a long talk with him, but it's, it's just little snippets on the screen. Now, uh, in your talks, did uh, you get to kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, pick uh, Mr. Gordon's brain about what Robert's creative style was like? Like, what was his process? Um, for doing these things. I mean, you know, did he have, um, you know, did he, did he go into it with like an idea of what exactly what he wanted and built off of that? Or did he, uh, was he more into like the spontaneity of it and just kind of like finding things and reworking things on the fly? Bob was, uh, was good about getting a vision and pursuing it. And a lot of that came from, from the animator came from Gordon, uh, because he showed him photos of uh, this morgue in uh, Chicago. I forget what it is. You, you might know, you're a Chicago guy. Uh, and I don't know if it exists anymore, but that is what, the, uh, what it was based on. And Bob saw the photos and he just started creating. You know, uh, it's kind of a shame it's not a real place because it would be nice to visit, you know? Um, yeah, if there was, uh, yeah, if there was like, you know, a Chicago horror tour, that would be a, a great stop because, I mean, you just look at a film like Reanimator and, you know, that was one of those films that just defined that decade in horror. I mean, I mean, the 80s in general is just when, uh, I mean, in the 70s is when all the rules were broken, right? You know, you had right. uh, Texas Chainsaw, which, I mean, with the exception of maybe like Psycho or like Night of the Hunter, I mean, 
I would I would consider it like the first um, slasher film, unless you want to like you know go back to like the Mummy's Hand and stuff where they're actually like choking people. But like the first actual slasher, gory, violent movie was Texas Chainsaw, and you know following that up with like Hills Have Eyes and Taurus Trap, like these were shocking movies in their day in a way that I don't think, yeah. you know, modern day moviegoers can comprehend just how shocking and just how um, uh, revolutionary they were. And Bob, you know, Bob Chainsaw and Chainsaw uh, money wise was a mess. Uh, there were gangsters involved, uh, you know, and nobody saw any money. And Bob was pissed and he was not going to do this again. He had a thriving advertising uh, business, screen printing business, and he wasn't going to do it again. But the folks behind the Hills Have Eyes tracked him down. Peter, the producer, tracked him down because he saw the look of Chainsaw and, and wanted to use him. Same thing with Howling. The that film had seen chainsaw and said we want that look you know and so he was forced back into the business in a weird way uh and moved briefly to los angeles but he really did not like los angeles so he came back to austin and he was dirt poor uh you know working on whatever he could <clears throat> a lot of times a lot of times very small projects done in texas uh and some just weird stuff massacres is uh something everyone should watch uh it's it's you know it's a weird comic send up of horror i don't know if there had been one like that before but everyone knows it.